9 a.m. in Beijing, Hong Kong, and Taipei. Welcome to Boomer Markets, China Open. I'm Yvonne Mann with Rashad Salama. Right, let's just check in with some of our top stocks. Asian equities on the up, even as the euphoria from the Federal Reserve's meeting starts to wane. Chinese stocks are set to open higher. This comes as investors look forward to the uh, People's Bank of China's MLF decision, plus a deluge of economic data, including November's industrial activity, retail sales and property prices. Plus, Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, speaking in Washington on U.S. economic uh, priorities with Beijing for the year ahead. Yep, we're certainly looking ahead to that speech there. Of course, we've heard a little bit about she plans to visit China again in 2024 for a second time uh, since she took the post as, as a, a Treasury Secretary. And certainly talking about the difficult issues that are at hand. Of course, we came out of this Biden-Xi meeting with a lot of ground that was covered, but not a whole lot deliverable. So we'll see if, if Yellen does bring up anything more concrete to the table. Absolutely. And, you know, we are looking at that. And she uh, seems to be uh, the best friend China has uh, in Washington at the moment. At least that's what it looks like. And, uh, of course, this all coming against a backdrop of a waning economy there in uh, 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 between uh, Beijing and Washington here as well. We've got uh, Janet Yellen now. We can actually probably hear from her very, very shortly. But while we wait for her to get to the lectern, which I believe she has done now, we can actually get over to D.C. and uh, hear what the U.S. Treasury Secretary has to say. Me to join you this evening, Mark. Thank you for that lovely introduction. We're here to... Right, well, we are, of course, just... There we go. We had, uh, of course, a few technical glitches there. I believe she, we can hear her again and uh, let's get back to Janet Yellen. President directed me and other senior officials to deepen our communication with China. All right. Well, clearly those uh, technical gremlins haven't gone away. Or the, this uh, feed coming out of Washington seems to have uh, a lot of issues. But uh, oh, well, if we, if we do actually get uh, a more sta in a more stable fashion, we'll get back uh, to the Treasury Secretary. But uh, meanwhile, let's just check in with the uh, market action, just checking in uh, with uh, what is in prospect for the Chinese trading day. We're looking as though we could be just seeing a bit of a lift up, uh, according to futures there for uh, uh, Chinese equities. Six-tenths of one percent up. We're looking at S&P futures just flat. And that after uh, another day where we did see, of course, uh, that whole euphoria surrounding what happened at the Federal Reserve's uh, latest meeting where essentially they're not going to be raising rates. We're looking at three cuts coming through the course of 2024 and uh, the uh, market itself coming around to thinking there'll be six. So there we go. They raise them by three. Well, while we uh, actually just uh, examine what's going on market-wise, we can also examine whether our feed out of Washington, D.C. is actually stable and get back uh, to Janet Yellen. The Biden administration strategy towards China begins with investing at home and rebuilding alliances abroad. When President Biden took office, considerable work was needed both domestically and internationally. The Trump administration had failed to make investments at home in critical areas like infrastructure, and advanced technology, while also neglecting relationships with our partners and allies that had been forged and strengthened over decades. This left America more vulnerable and more isolated in a competitive global economy that demand, demands that nations take exactly the opposite approach. It damaged our global standing and meant significant missed economic opportunities for American firms and workers. Over the past three years, the Biden administration has course corrected. We're investing at home through President Biden's Investing in America agenda. The administration's economic plan helped power 
and historically fast recovery from the pandemic. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, together with the private sector investments they're driving, are fueling economic growth, building the clean energy industries of the future, and increasing opportunity for people and places in America that have historically been left behind. We're also deepening our ties with countries around the world, including those in the Indo-Pacific. In my trips to India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam, I saw the region's dynamism firsthand. Greater economic integration with the region, when pursued strategically, can be immensely beneficial. We can boost production at home to serve expanding markets, creating jobs for American workers, and we can partner to bolster our economic security, including through building more, more secure supply chains, increasing America's resilience while enabling more growth in Indo-Pacific economies. As I've said before, America's fundamental economic strength means that we have nothing to fear from healthy economic competition with China or any other country. Our strength positions us to seek new opportunities while navigating challenges. It's within this context that we've shaped our economic approach to China. I and other U.S. officials have repeatedly stated that the United States does not seek to decouple from China. This would be damaging to both our economies and would have negative global repercussions. In my speech on the U.S.-China economic relationship in April, I made this clear. I also laid out three objectives for our relationship. The United States will pursue a healthy economic relationship with China, one that benefits both sides. We will seek to cooperate with China on global challenges. And because our national security must remain our foremost priority, we will deploy our economic tools when needed to secure our country's national security interests and protect human rights. Over the past year, we've advanced this vision. China's share of global GDP was less than 3%. Now, it's almost 18%. China has become the United States' third largest trading partner after Canada and Mexico. The United States is China's largest. This provides a tremendous opportunity, one I know many council members and others here today see clearly. American exports to China and Chinese investment in the United States can support American jobs. And American business and create even more jobs. But for too long, American workers and firms have not been able to compete on a level playing field with those in China. The PRC deploys unfair economic practices from non-market tools to barriers to access for foreign firms to coercive actions against American companies. These policies harm American workers and firms. And over the past year, we have consistently raised these concerns through the working groups and direct diplomacy. So let me be clear, I will always champion your interests and work to make sure that American workers and firms are treated fairly. 
If the PRC were to shift away from its state-driven economic approach in industry and finance, I believe that would be better for the PRC as well. Too strong a role for state-owned enterprises can choke growth and an excessive role for the security apparatus can dissuade investment. I hear frequently from American companies about the challenges they're facing. The Council's 2023 member survey revealed that companies are reconsidering their investment plans and resource commitments, with a higher proportion of companies indicating plans to move some of their operations out of China than in any year since 2016. These trends should be concerning to China and point to the potential benefits to China of pursuing structural reforms and treating foreign firms fairly. That have resulted from China's economic practices at a critical moment in its economic trajectory. Alongside seeking a healthy economic relationship, we've also pursued cooperation with China on global challenges. The physical and economic impacts of climate change continue to mount. Too many low income and emerging market economies suffer from unsustainable debt. In response, the Biden administration's investments at home and deepen ties abroad are restoring America's leadership in addressing the urgent and severe global challenges of our time. But as the world's two largest economies representing 40% of global GDP, the US and China together have an obligation to drive collective action for the benefit of people and economies around the world. Treasury and the People's Bank of China co-chaired the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, though there's much more to be done to increase our collaboration on climate. We've worked with China on sovereign debt issues in developing countries, and we see potential for recent progress on specific cases to open the door to better and faster resolution strengthen the international financial system. China has now agreed, along with most other countries, to an equally proportional quota increase at the International Monetary Fund that will strengthen the role of the IMF at the center of the global financial safety net. As we've pursued a healthy economic relationship and cooperation on global challenges, We've also maintained our commitment to protect our and our allies' national security using economic tools when needed. This is an area where we cannot and will not compromise, but our administration has also made sure to clearly explain our actions and directly express our concerns. We communicate to avoid misunderstandings that could ca cause harmful instability. We did this with the rollout of President Biden's executive order on outbound investment last August, where we're taking narrow, targeted action and are being transparent about our rationale and our intent. We've also communicated our concerns with certain PRC actions including its export controls on critical minerals, as well as the support that certain Chinese companies have provided for Russia's defense industrial sector. When I met with Vice Premier He last month, the progress the U.S. and China had made over the past year was evident. We jointly stated that neither side is seeking to decouple 
that we welcome the objective of a healthy economic relationship that provides a living, level playing field, that we're committed to working together on global challenges, and that we will intensify communication going forward through our This progress will serve us in the year ahead. So let me provide an overview of three main priorities for the US-China economic relationship in 2024. First, over the next year, the United States will aim to continue to responsibly manage the US-China bilateral economic relationship. We know this relationship will face continued challenges. There are many areas on which the U.S. and China strongly disagree. There is also always the risk of shocks that impact both of our countries. We seek not to resolve all our disagreements nor avoid all shocks because this is in no way realistic. But we aim to make our communication resilient so that when we disagree, when shocks occur, we prevent misunderstanding from leading to escalation and causing harm. Our work began by establishing durable communication challenges, communication channels that can withstand challenging circumstances. Next year, the working groups will continue to meet regularly. And I plan to take my second trip to China as Treasury Secretary, where a significant portion of the agenda will focus on commitment to clear communication on our actions from our outbound investment regime to the rollout of additional Inflation Reduction Act provisions to our sanctions and we will keep pressing the PRC on its national security actions. Continuing to stabilize our relationship to prevent escalation, that won't make news. But our economies, our people, and again, also economies and people around the world will be safer and more secure. This is what it means for the U.S. and China to build and responsibly manage our relationship. Second, over the next year, we will continue pressing for clarity on China's economic policies and policymaking to better inform our own decisions. changes in demand in China, in fact, Chinese economic policy more broadly, mattered far less to the rest of the world. Now, at nearly 20% of the global economy, China is too large to export its way to growth, and its economic policy choices have far-reaching consequences. The same is true for financial stability. Financial shocks in China and China's response to them do not occur in isolation. Understanding China's plans, especially how China intends to respond to challenges with local government debt and the real estate market, or how it might react if unexpected weaknesses in the economy should arise, is crucial for those of us charged with policymaking in the United States. As we learn more, we will continue to raise concerns on areas where the US and China disagree, from the possible global spillovers of China's industrial policies to actions China has taken that can disadvantage the private sector. We will also ask for greater transparency on China's non-market practices and foreign exchange practices. We will reinforce, along with our partners and allies, that for a healthy economic relationship to be sustainable, it's a 
considered decisions on behalf of our citizens, and it also helps policymakers in the many other economies that could be affected by the choices China makes. Third, over the next year, we will aim to accelerate our work with China on areas where our countries and many others would benefit from our collaboration and joint leadership. It is often well understood that military leaders need to have quick and reliable means of communication to keep a crisis from spiraling out of control. For economic policymakers responding to financial stress, it's also critical to know the counterpart on the other end of the line and be able to make a quick call. To enable this, the United States and China will facilitate exchanges between our financial regulators, as the United States does regularly with major financial centers, such as the European Union and the United Kingdom. We already have efforts underway to exchange information. Well, let us just uh, leave uh, China Yellen there because we're getting these headlines out of China at the moment. And uh, certainly uh, it is uh, broadly expected. We've got uh, the MLF, the medium-term lending facility, they're being kept at, uh, what, 2.5%. Uh, That's a one-year. We've got 100 billion uh, yuan, uh, a net 100 billion yuan, uh, being injected via this facility here. It is the largest, uh, it's a monthly uh, record here uh, that we have right now. And uh, this uh, essentially, basically what we were expecting uh, with regard to what uh, they're doing in terms of monetary policy. Uh, it is a sense of them bolstering liquidity uh, in a major way here as well. And uh, uh, we can get to now uh, Julio Caligari. He's CIO of Asia Fix Income at JP Morgan Asset Management. Julio, we're hearing Janet Yellen. We're seeing what the PBOC is doing. Again, this is about liquidity, isn't it? And that's what they're seeing. But uh, it, there is pressure for them to reduce this, uh, Julio. Um, well, I think uh, there is no uh, major surprise here, yeah. right? Uh, so basically we, we are seeing uh, China trying basically to keep the monetary conditions um, kind of stable uh, in order to support the economy. And so we are not seeing any new news there. Okay. Uh that is China. I'm sure we'll get back to that, but I, but I want to just get a, a, a sense of what you are seeing in terms of Christmas coming early as the uh, Federal Reserve in the form of Vijay Powell playing Santa, just right. to change the whole market dynamic. But, you know, the thing is, how sustainable is all this? And, you know, with six rate cuts being penciled in, are they getting ahead of themselves? Well, I think it's possible that, you know, the market will get a bit ahead of itself. Um, uh, certainly, I think what matters the most here is the direction. And the new news is that the Fed will be cutting rates uh, next year. Uh, we think that indeed the market may be uh, pricing too much at this juncture. Uh, but in any case, I think what matters here is that the direction is quite positive and we may continue to see, you know, rates going down over time, which will be quite supportive for, for Asia. Because as you know, you know, in, in Asia, we have basically a lot of the central banks that uh, uh, have not been cutting rates just because the Fed is in this position with, uh, uh, in, in such a tight uh, uh, monetary policy condition. So once we get the Fed moving, this will be really supportive uh, for the Asian central banks. Julio, how does the ECB and BOE overnight maybe change that sort of backdrop? I'm just wondering the fact that they didn't endorse that perhaps they're closing in at the end of their tightening cycle and, and they haven't even discussed talking about cutting rates. Are, are we still talking about central banks next year outdoving each other? I mean, how does this all going to play out in your eyes? Well, I think that it's true that from the perspective of Japan, for example, they, they probably are in, in another stage, right? Actually, after many years, finally, we are seeing inflation in, in Japan, and we, we are expecting some normalization of the yield curve control uh, next year, which I think one, one thing that I would highlight here is that this tends to be quite supportive for the Japanese yen. And this is one of the pillars of why we expect a much better performance for Asia uh, FX. Uh, in the case of Europe, uh, I think the, Europe, the European economy is, is slowing as well more clearly. Um, 
and so in this sense, I think the, the, uh, even though they're uh, not, you know, uh, being too dovish versus expectations, uh, but we think that in the end, the CB uh, will cut rates as well. And so we, the, the path of ECB and the Fed are more aligned. While, you know, in, in the case of Japan, we have a discrepancy here. And as I said, this, this should be quite supportive for Asia FX in our view. Uh, Julio, uh, you know, with regard to investment strategy, like then, exactly the same question, Yvonne. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, it gives a sense of, uh, of your investment strategy, you know, if it has changed at all with regards to this pivot. Yeah, so I think the, the Fed pivot is one of the pillars for a much better outlook uh, for the Asia fixed income in 2024. Uh, the other being growth uh, in, in Asia actually uh, holding up well while we see the slowdown, particularly in U.S. So the growth differential will be in favor of, of Asia. So those are the key two pillars in favor of the Asia uh, story here. Um, and what we, we think is this is supportive for uh, credit assets, broadly speaking. So we think that FX will benefit uh, definitely, particularly with the outlook for, for the yen and also the Chinese renminbi will not get weaker in, in our view. So those uh, elements are quite supportive for the FX in, in Asia. Uh, at the same time in which even though credit spreads are tight in, in Asia, but truth is that growth differential will be more supportive, and we also see very limited supply. Um, so these are the conditions that even from a tight place yeah. on the spreads, it could get tighter. Julia, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, thank you for being so patient with us. We had those glitches with uh, Janet Yellen there, but uh, thank you for our understanding. Uh, Julia Caligari there, he's the CIO of Asia Fixed Income at JP Morgan Asset Management. There we go. That's a look at what we're watching out for. We've got a lot of data also coming out, activity news. This is Bloomberg. All right, this is uh, Bloomberg Markets. We've got uh, 40 seconds to go before the last uh, trading day of the week. Uh, Hang Seng pre-market up 1.3%. Uh, we are looking at, of course, a slew of data to come out of China in the uh, top of the hour. We're also getting house price news in uh, the next few seconds. But uh, our eyes are really going to be concentrating on industrial production. We're looking, of course, at retail sales and fixed asset uh, investment as well. And uh, essentially, when we look at these numbers, they are going to be flattering to deceive in some senses, Yvonne, because we are looking at, of course, that, uh, the same period last year, one where we saw much of China exiting from their COVID zero policy, and that, of course, was a time of uh, quite depressed uh, uh, economic activity, of course, here as well. Industrial production expected uh, to be up in November 5.7%. The open is upon us now. Let us just have a look at the cash market as it uh, kicks off. Hang Seng, 1.3%, and we're seeing uh, things, generally speaking, in the green here. So uh, we're looking also at these property numbers to come up very shortly, Yvonne. And and uh, looking, of course, at the overall picture uh, for what's going on in the economic, for the economic climate in China. Yeah, you know, we're seeing it, whether we do see a f six straight month where new home prices have been in negative territory. If that's the case, then it's another sign that perhaps we have not seen a bottom in this property crisis in China and really kind of bodes ill about what this activity day is going to look like. You talked about the flattering year on year numbers, uh, but then again, yeah. month on month, there are probably better comparisons this time around. We have those new home prices coming in. There you go, falling 0.37% month on month. So a six straight month of contraction when it comes to uh, home prices and that drop, although a little bit of a caveat there, slower than what we saw back in October. But still, we're talking about negative territory here. So we'll see how the property sector sort of reacts to this. Obviously, we did see, of course, some new easing of, of house, home buying measures when it comes to Beijing and Shanghai. That certainly is one that could be driving a lot of these moves. The likes of Evergrande here today. Take a look at that. We're up some 4%. Uh, also, we learned a little bit more about them, maybe cutting some stakes here as well to alleviate some of the cash squeeze. Uh, BYD, Neo, are watching the evening. EV space. There were some rules in France uh, talking about uh, how the EV sector is going to play out here. That certainly is not really, uh, you know, 
helping or, ben or hurting uh, the EV sector, with NEO up some 5%. And I think it's still that pivot party that is going on here in Asia right now, right? And Vinda International, that's the one to watch. We're up 7%. The Indonesian tycoon is buying the company. This is the toilet paper company listed here in Hong Kong. Uh, and I think it's a pretty hefty premium, about 13% or so. That's why we are seeing the prices higher this morning. Let's bring in Charlie Ju, our Shanghai bureau chief, on more of that home buying easing that we're hearing uh, when it comes to some of these tier one st uh, the cities there to try to stem this route that we're seeing. And, and Charlie, just given what we saw in this new home price data, you, 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 it makes sense why we're hearing more measures to help stimulate this property market. Yeah, the, the news about, about, about Shanghai, Beijing easing uh, home buying again, uh, you know, came out last night. Uh, this time it's, it's pretty a, a significant one. They, they, they lower the, the, you know, down payment uh, threshold for first time and also second home buyers. Uh, you know, Beijing and Shanghai among the most important uh, property markets in the country. Um, you know, uh, it's serves as a, it serves as a benchmark, you know, for for uh, property investors. So, if you know the policy can you know, stimulate a new wave of uh, property uh, demand, um, probably you know there will be some you know spillover effects, you know, uh, helping uh, stir up some buying interest elsewhere. Uh, the the property market, you know, industry remains the biggest concern for Chinese economy at the moment, as you know, it accounts for like you know 20 percent of China's overall GDP. Um, so, you know, uh, despite all the, you know, measures we're allowed this year to uh, prop up demand, um, in, in, most buyers remain on the sidelines. And, you know, the, the, that, that, the, and that kind of sentiment has been reflected in the property prices you just uh, flagged. Charlie, let's look ahead uh, 17 minutes before we get uh, the uh, activity data, industrial production, chiefly in retail sales, that will be looked at. But I mean, we shouldn't be looking on the year on year numbers, should we? As uh, what was happening last year will really at the moment mean that the base effects will be rather flattering to deceive. But it, it's about month on month and sequential numbers here, which are going to be the key. Yes, you're right. Uh, so last year, because of the pandemic, you know, or, you know, economic activities are, you know, being kind of uh, uh, suppressed. Uh, so if you use month on month, uh, year on year comparison, it will be kind of misleading. But anyway, people are looking beyond, you know, this year. It's really November, right? Uh, so next year's economic target, well, you know, uh, we heard, you know, based on uh, research reports that we've, we've seen, it's going to be about 5%, which is, you know, pretty ambitious one. And people are expecting more fiscal, you know, stimulus, you know, to come out uh, next year. And, uh, uh, and and you may have you know remember uh, the, the the latest uh, policy signal from the economic central economic work conference. Uh, the focus will be on fiscal stimulus. Uh, monetary easing will only play a supportive role. So that's why the MRF rate you're seeing this morning, you know, was kept on change, and and probably you know uh, the the further downside will be also limited because of you know concerns about yuan depreciation pressure and also you know uh, the shrinking profit margin for the banking industry. Charlie, thanks very much. Charlie Zhu, the Ch Shanghai Bureau Chief. Uh, Jing Lu is uh, Greenwich China Chief Economist at HSBC Global Research, and she's with me now in the studio. Jing, thanks for joining us. Right, you know, we've got this data coming up uh, in a short while. We saw the home price news. I mean, the housing market is causing all these eruptions, in, in essence. And in some ways, you know, people are hoping that there's going to be a big bazooka, but it appears that that's not going to happen, although because it would have happened. So why are we still waiting for it? And what do we need here? I think, you know, right now, in terms of the housing market, a bazooka stimulus may not work because that will put us back to the story of another rally and then they need to clean up the mess again. So I think the recent uh, talk about the dual track model is actually quite promising. The idea is to have a clear segregation between the so-called commercial housing market and then the social housing market. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the Economic Work Conference, it did not really that specific on uh, what uh, is happening in the housing market, but it, it was, of course, the elephant in the room. The narrative has changed, though, from uh, lifting domestic demand, which is the number one priority now, to uh, going up the value chain, industrially speaking. This is, is this the, the sort of uh, model of growth that they're trying to get towards now, or is this just one which might actually help the other, if you will? 
I think it's the one uh, to help the other. Basically, China is still eyeing on expanding the domestic consumption, um, you know, manufacturing upgrading as well as the green transition. That might be the future growth engine. And in the recent Central Economic World Conference, it's emphasized that uh, you know uh, China needs to establish the new model uh, uh, before basically phasing out from the old one. That basically speaks to the smooth transition. Jingli, does it mean have we reached a bottom in this economy? And what is the November data going to tell us at the top of the hour here, given that year and year is pretty distorted? What are the month on month numbers going to tell you? Well, I think actually if we look at the activity data, it shows that Q2 likely uh, was a trough. And after that, we see the slow or gradual recovery, except that the housing market continues to be the pen. So I think now the uh, most important thing is to stabilize the housing market. That can boost the confidence overall for consumer, for business probably as well. Uh, and uh, then China can you know, uh, allocate more resources in terms of the structural uh, transition. It, this is a kind that's still in deflation. Is that likely going to dampen any sort of uptick when it comes to retail sales moving forward? Well, I think uh, actually when we look at the retail sales, uh, clearly um, things related to the offline activities still seem to be quite resilient. The biggest drag comes from the um, you know housing-related sector, uh, the construction, you know, uh, materials as well as decoration. And in terms of the CPI number, um, actually you know food is one factor dragging it down, and softer commodity prices. And another thing again is related to uh, how. We see rents actually account for uh, around a quarter of the core CPI weight, and uh, rent obviously uh, is uh, also decreasing because of the housing market correction. So are, are you concerned that you know, this could lead to some sort of deflationary spiral, right? Not just you know, focus on the property market, but could this spread more to, to businesses and consumers as well? That maybe these, these price pressures are just going to hurt people from wanting to spend more. Um, I think, you know, basically when the ordinary people think about whether they want to spend, they probably care more about, uh, you know, what's their income look like and also income expectation. So that will uh, basically depend on how the labor market will go from now. Uh, and also they might look at the wealthy facts. So uh, probably less about, you know, uh, the overall uh, deflationary, uh, a temporary deflationary environment. And our forecasts show that uh, the CPI uh, uh, number probably will turn positive in uh, second half of next year. So Jing, I mean, the thing is, what can they do? I mean, here as well, because I mean, as they transition, it's going to be giving this pain. Uh, but also, you know, they've got to keep society happy. That's that's the other aspect of it. Uh, and you know, what, what evidence is there of there a pickup of uh, employment taking place right now? We should be getting data on that as well. Of course, we won't get youth employment figures uh, because they don't really publish those anymore. So, you know, what's your take here? Well, I think overall unemployment numbers seem to be more or less back to the pre-pandemic level. But uh, talking about the, you know, the, the structure of employment, we might see more kind of uh, gig economy job and uh, some sectors which used to give the high income, such as internet education and the property, uh, might now in, still in a consolidation. So in that sense, uh, the income, from the income perspective, we see that grow slower than before. Um, how optimistic are you about fiscal stimulus next year, Jing Lu? I mean, obviously, it seems like monetary policy has taken a bit of a back seat, given what we heard with the MLF just now. But, I mean, given the fact that these local governments are still quite constrained financially, you know, should we temper our expectations of just how much of a fiscal boost we'll see next year? Well, I actually remain very uh, optimistic about the fiscal stimulus, and this time probably the central government will do a heavier lifting rather than the local government. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, the uh, ad hoc issuance of one trillion RMB in fourth quarter, as well as revising up the fiscal deficit to 3.8 percent in the fourth quarter, also send a signal that they are going to be more proactive. In the recent uh, important meetings, they also highlight that. Uh, 
uh, you know, there's going to be optimization for central and local government uh, debt structure. There's going to be, uh, you know, more collaboration across different kind of policies. And I think that's very important. Now, you know, if you go to this pro-growth answer, you know, we got the money supply figures the other day. Uh, credit uh, uh, demand is showing some improvement. The, the, we're seeing some green shoots. Where else are you seeing them? Well, I think, you know, the credit data this time, a lot of support seemed to come from the um, government uh, bond issuance and uh, the green shoots for others. For example, we see the retail sales, especially the service retail sales, continue to be very resilient. Last month's data uh, for the first 10 months of this year, it's growing around 20% year on year. And we also see, for example, in the uh, auto sales space, uh, the first three weeks of number in November show strong growth. Uh, in fact, really, is this money going in the right places, though? That's the point. Well, I think, you know, um, uh, in the economic downturn, when the government is doing more, probably um, we will need some time before the animal spirit pick up and then the market will have a better resource allocation. Jing, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Jing Liu there, uh, to go to China, Chief Economist at HSBC Global Research. Now, coming up, we're going to be biting into the expansion plans of the noodle chain. Tam Jaya, the Chief Executive, joining us next to discuss where they're targeting new restaurants in the year ahead. This has been Peg. Yep, we're checking these property stocks here. The gauge here is surging a little bit, about 3% or so for your Bloomberg Intelligence China Developers Index here. On the prospect here of what we've heard of local uh, home buying easing when it comes to these mega cities. So it's Beijing, it's Shanghai. They're not only cutting down the payment ratio for first and second time homes, Brish, but also changing the definition of these so-called non-luxury homes. A whole, likely, hopefully, they're hoping that that could actually stimulate some demand. Well, absolutely. You look at Shanghai, Beijing, and, you know, there's one thing they do have in common, like they do here in Hong Kong, and uh, that is uh, a love of noodles. It's not actually quite lunchtime uh, right here at the moment, but uh, we've got noodles on our minds, or are they on our heads? I don't know. Specifically, Yunnan style Mishian uh, rice noodles, <laughs> a speciality of the Tam Jai restaurant chain. The company has a big expansion plan for next year, including entering its first Western Market. Darren Lau is chairman and CEO of Tam Jai and uh, Tam Jai International. He's right here in the studio. Darren, thank you so much for joining us. Right, give us a sense of where you are uh, in terms of the number of restaurants and where you want to be, let's say, this time next year and how you get there. Yeah, I, I think it, it's a very exciting moment for us because we are now having a new chapter to, for our development. Uh, in the past few years, we've been developing quite well in Hong Kong and then we get into China and we also have our branches get into Singapore and Japan. Next year, we're getting into Australia and also Philippines uh, with a new, uh, brand new uh, type of model. Uh, we're having the partnership approach, we have the joint venture and also franchise uh, stores. Okay. Uh, now, Darren, you know, I've got to ask you the fundamental question here as well. As we see this economic slowdown, you, know, you could actually be a beneficiary as people uh, actually go for the cheaper option of having noodles rather than actually having full-blown uh, a la carte meals in fancy restaurants here as well. So what are you seeing on the ground? Uh, I think uh, for us, we are on a fast cash uh, segment. We also are uh, the comfort food. It's a daily food, so it's been less uh, affecting, uh, less fluctuating. In fact, over the last few years, throughout the COVID, we still have a CAGR of 12%, which is quite impressive to go through this uh, difficult period. Any of the choices on the menu changed? Uh, we, uh, actually, we have a lot of choices. You can make your noodles uh, in your way, uh, customize your way, and we have almost like 630,000 combinations that you can make. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Darren, can you tell us a bit more about how your mainland business is doing? I mean, just given the fact that we have seen, you know, this is an economy that's still in deflation here right now. How is that impacting the prices that you put on your noodles and your margins? Right after the border opened this year, uh, we see quite a good uh, growth in the beginning, but then uh, it's been slowed down and we can see uh, that's probably because of the, uh, uh, the economy transition. Uh, so per particularly in Shenzhen, we see uh, uh, the, the sales are not very good, the footfall in the, uh, in the malls are not very good. So we have uh, shifted our development strategies to go into the tier two cities and also Guangzhou, which still have a quite good demand. So on that aspect, uh, we are quite, uh, doing quite well in the tier two. Here too, and also Guangzhou. How, how, 
are you looking at something like food inflation, right? We still see it all around the world. It, it, are you still confident that you're going to see your margins bottom out this year? We, uh, in fact, we managed the food inflation quite well. Uh, we've been uh, having the global uh, sourcing. Uh, so we've been shifting uh, different suppliers with a, a better prices or better quality. Uh, on top of that, we also have been always introducing new items or new products, which we can also get a better price and also get a, a better cost. So on that aspect, we are managed quite well. Darren, I mean, you're going to be launching in Australia, you're going to be launching in the Philippines and beyond here as well. Uh, now, uh, this is a, a big challenge. How, does, how do you do this? Are you confident? It's, it's like dipping your toe into foreign waters, isn't it, I suppose? And uh, is your offering going to be exactly the same or will it be tailored to the uh, diets of these countries? Well, in fact, this is one of our strategic development to go into the Australia. Uh, we see that this is a, a market with a lot of Asian and also Chinese. Uh, for our noodles, it should, be, it should be quite suitable. And we also see a rising population of the Asian and Chinese. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, when we do entering into the different countries, we also do the survey. And we can see there's a lot of uh, 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 soup noodles coming, uh, especially the spicy noodles. Uh, I think uh, you, you may also notice that the trend for the spicy food are in increasing uh, and if you go to the Google you can also see the Mala search has been also searching. Darren, there's a lot of competition uh, I feel like in Australia right now when it comes to, to noodles. Um, <laughs> how do you stand out? Is it still the price point? I mean, what else can you do to really kind of stand out in this, in this market? Uh, first of all, we uh, really believe in our taste. Uh, as you know, in Hong Kong, we are now the number one noodles. Uh, we have taken the pace like uh, wonton noodles or cart noodles, which are the tra traditional noodles in Hong Kong. So the taste itself is uh, very good and it's been quite universal. We get into Singapore, Japan, they all love it. On top of that, uh, you can customize your spicy level and when you hit the spicy level, you will be totally hooked. So uh, we have a lot of very good food. <laughs> Uh, and and then uh, we also have a, a very uh, 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 famous snacks to accom uh, accompany with. So we believe that we can also get into the Western market in the big wave. Okay, so so Darren, obviously the spiciness is is the big uh, attraction factor here. I'm just wondering what what sort of targets you have for these two markets, the Philippines and Australia, and and what's next in terms of your expansion plans. Uh, of course, for, for the, first, uh, uh, the first batch will be the uh, Chinese and Asian or Hong Kong people where they are resided in Australia. But then we will move on to the uh, 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 Caucasian, uh, Australian. Uh, I think uh, Australian is also very well versed with the different types of Asian noodles and they are uh, pretty much like uh, understand what it is. So uh, it is a, an easy uh, a, a move to, uh, to get into more uh, people to try our noodles. Darren, thank you so much uh, for having you on when you've opened these restaurants and find out how things are going. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, you used Australian firemen in your latest promotion uh, here in Hong Kong, didn't you? So, <laughs> yes, so there we go. Yeah. Can't wait for that. And that went down well. <laughs> yes, yes. We'd be very happy about that. And, uh, well, for sure, because we are getting into Australia. We've got to go. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, Darren Lau, Chairman and CEO of Tab and Jai International. We've got uh, a lot more coming up right here. Thank you for having me. On Bloomberg Markets China Open. All right, the next event to watch in the next seven minutes, of course, is that activity data dump coming out of China. Of course, looking to see if we see any signs of maybe a glimmer of a recovery. But, you know, don't, don't really look at the year-on-year -year figures, right? We talked about how you're comparing it to November, which was during, you know, emerging out of this COVID zero lockdown. So certainly, you know, it flatters the numbers. Month on month might be a little bit better. And then again, we also had that MLF, which kind of disappointed investors in some ways as well. Um, but certainly the property news today, yes, new home prices are still in negative territory, but the fact that we're seeing some home buying easing when it comes to Beijing and Shanghai, that's really lifting the mood overall.
Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, we have, uh, at the moment anyway, uh, uh, Shanghai Cup just going negative, but uh, Hong Kong doing well. But uh, certainly it's uh, uh, all liable to possibly uh, change as we get uh, these numbers. Uh, here we go. Ahead of all this, uh, this is a look at the property side of things here as well. A bit of relief, uh, uh, really. And uh, we've got, a th I think, a 3.5-4% move to the upside there for the property index. Uh, overall, equities buoyed up in this one of the world, but just uh, seeing a little bit of uh, perhaps uh, a weakness in China, but CSI is positive, and uh, we look to retail sales, industrial production, and fixed asset investment all on the way after this very short break.